let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study this day. Thank you, Lord, for the interest and the love you've given all your children to be here. We're praying that you open our eyes of understanding. We'll behold great, wonderful things out of your word in Jesus' name. And Lord, we pray that your grace and your strength and the divine energy will be given to every one of us so that we'll be who we ought to be and we'll be prepared for the coming of the Lord in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. I welcome every one of you to our Bible study tonight. It's a joy to be together to study the word of God together. Recently, just about two weeks ago, we started the study of the book of Revelation. We've gone through verses 1 through to 6 in chapter 1. And today we come to two verses of scripture. Two verses that are very important. As we look at them, you'll see how important they are. In fact, it's like these two verses are the summary of the whole uh, book of Revelation and the purpose of the book of Revelation, the climax of the book of Revelation. Look at them. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 verse 8. Behold, the comet were the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and he also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. As we read these words, and as we look at these verses of scripture, they give us the sublime climactic announcement of the greatest event in the program of God for the church, in the program of God for Israel, in the program of God for the world. Do you see the announcement here at the beginning of verse 7? Behold, he cometh with the clouds. It's like stop every other thing. Behold, look at this. Listen to this one. The announcement of the ages. And it is coming to pass. And it says, behold. Can I tell you that in the book of Revelation, you'll find that word behold about 30 times. And it's like as the Lord was revealing the revelation to John and he showed him and signified it to him. It was like seeing a film, but it was drama all through, activity all through. An angel comes and he does something. A veil is open and something happens. A thunder breaks out and something happens again. And every time there is an important event. It's like the Lord telling John, and through John, the Lord telling us, stop everything else. Look at this one. Behold this one. And it says, as he saw, that the Lord will be coming. And then he said, here is the fulfillment of the promise that had been given, of the prophecy that had been made from the book of Genesis, all through to the end of Malachi, and then from Matthew, all through to Jude. And now he says, I'm seeing it coming to pass. It's in a picture already. And behold, Look at this one. Believe it, it's going to happen. He cometh with the clouds. In fact, the announcement of the coming of the Lord, you'll find seven times in this book of Revelation. I just read one to you now, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he cometh. And then you get to Revelation chapter 2, verse 25. What do you find there? Hold fast till I come. He's telling you again that he is coming. And then Revelation chapter 3 verse 11. Again it is, behold, I come quickly. And then he tells us of, for the first time, Revelation chapter 16 verse 15. He says, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth, so that he'll keep his garments and he'll not walk naked. And then the fifth time, Revelation chapter 22 verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. Revelation 22 verse 12, behold, I come quickly. Now the seventh time. Revelation chapter 22 verse 20, surely I come quickly. And John replied, and the whole church is replying, amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The Lord is coming. I say the Lord is coming. As you look at the prophecy of the coming of the Lord, this prophetic announcement this is the very first prophetic announcement in the book of Revelation. When it says, Behold, he cometh. And then before you just close the book, the very last prophetic declaration that you find in the book of Revelation is that surely, 
I come quickly. This must be very important because he begins with it. And he ends with it. And everything in between the first chapter and the last chapter is pointing to and running through and getting to the coming of the Lord. As you look at the coming of the Lord, it's prophetic. And when we're dealing with, uh, with prophecy, there is no other book in the whole world apart from the Bible that has so much prophecy. Prophecy means the future prediction of coming events. And you know some prophecies already. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between the seed and her seed. And he shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. That's prophecy. It came to pass. And then when Jesus Christ came, he uttered a lot of prophecies himself, recorded in the New Testament. As you look at the whole Bible, we're told that one fifth of the whole scriptures is taken up with prophecy. That means if you divide your Bible to five parts, one part out of five is just prophecy and prophecy alone. Think about this now. One third of all those prophecies, they deal with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It must be very important then to occupy a very central place, a conspicuous place in the scriptures. As you look at the general prophecies, you count them one by one by one. You have 660 general prophecies. Some of the prophecies are repeated. That this will happen. A prophet will say it. Another prophet will pick it up again and say this will happen. As you look at all those prophecies and then you remove the repetitions. You have 660 general prophecies. Concerning Christ, we have 333. And those prophecies concerning Christ are divided into two parts. Some prophecies are related to his first coming. When he came, a child is born. A son is given. And that's part of the prophecy that he'll be born at, in Bethlehem. And then he will grow up. And all the miracles he'll perform. And the way he will die. And then that he will rise up again. Then that he will come again. 224 of those prophecies are still to be fulfilled. Because they relate to the second coming of Christ. When you think about the first coming of Christ. When he was born in Bethlehem. And the second coming of Christ. When he will appear in the skies. There were 46 Old Testament prophets that prophesied about Christ. But less than 10 of them spoke about his first coming. And think about this. 36 of those Old Testament prophets they spoke about his second coming. That means then, if the prophecies concerning the first coming of Christ, if those prophecies were fulfilled, the prophecies concerning the second coming of Christ, of course, Surely, certainly, without any shadow of doubt, they're going to be fulfilled. There are over 1,500 Old Testament passages referring to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. When well, you come to the New Testament and you count the verses of the New Testament one by one, one out of every 25 verses in the New Testament directly refers to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. How about Jesus Christ himself? Did he mention the second coming? Of course. The Lord Jesus Christ mentioned the second coming 21 times. And as we look at the New Testament, we're told to be ready for the return of the Lord over 50 times. Every time the first coming of Christ is mentioned, the second coming of Christ is mentioned eight times. Well, if you understand, and you analyze all those figures I've given to you, you must understand then that the second coming of Christ is a major, major theme in the Word of God. That's why we come to it today and we want to study the declaration of the Lord, the certainty, the assurance that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming and is coming again. He came the first time in humiliation. He'll come the second time in exaltation. He came the first time to come and give us grace. He'll come the second time and be coming with glory. He came the first time and he pushed him here and there. But he'll be coming the second time and he will rule the world with a rod of iron. That's what we're looking at. Our Lord is coming again. And by the grace of God, you will be with him. And you will reign with him in Jesus' name. We're going to consider three points in the message today. Number one, the glory of Christ's second coming. The glory 
of Christ's second coming. Number two, gladness and gloominess at Christ's second coming. That is, there'll be some people that will rejoice when Christ comes again. But there'll be some other people because they are not ready for the coming of the Lord. It will be sorrow for them. It will be shame on them. And it will be punishment for them. There'll be gladness on the one hand, gloominess on the other hand. At the time when Christ comes again, number three, God's guarantee that Christ will come again. God's guarantee of Christ's second coming. He is coming. God himself said so. He is coming. Jesus himself said so. He is coming. The Holy Ghost, the Spirit of truth said so. He is coming. The prophet said so. He is coming. The apostles said so. He is coming. The angels announced that Christ is coming again. The God who cannot lie has given us a guarantee that Jesus will surely come. Thank God is coming again. Point number one, the glory, the glory of Christ's second coming. Look at Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. Behold, he cometh with the clouds. Behold, he cometh with the clouds. As we talk about the second coming of the Lord, there are many, many things in scripture that demand that Christ must come again. Number one, the promise of God demands that Christ must come again in Psalm 2, verses 8 and 9. You will see here, here is the promise of God the Father unto the only begotten Son. And this promise of the Father to the Son tells us it must be fulfilled. Don't you know there is no promise that the Father had ever given that was not fulfilled. First of all, he says in verse 6, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree in verse 7. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Here comes now the promise and the prophecy ask of me. And I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. That has not happened yet. It must happen. Because heaven and earth may pass away, but the word of the Father, the word of God, will never pass away. That promise of the Father, given to the Lord Jesus Christ, demands that Christ must come again. Number two, Jesus himself, the words of Jesus Christ, demand that he must come again. He must come again. Didn't he say in my father's house are many mansions? If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. That demands he must come again. Because he cannot lie. is Jesus, the truth and the life and the way. And because of his own words, the demand is he must come again. It's not only his proclamation, his parables. Also demand that he must come again. In Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Reading from verse 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain noble man went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. To receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. His proclamation demands he must come again. And his parables demand that he must come again. Not only that, number three, the guarantee of the Holy Ghost uh, demands that Christ must come come again. Don't you understand? All the things that are written in the New Testament, they were inspired by the Spirit of God. Every time you read about the second coming of Christ, that's the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, giving us a guarantee that Jesus must come again. Not only that, the program of, for the church demands that he must come again. He has a program for the church. It's not going to leave the church down here. It's preparing the church for some 
one thing because it says husbands love your wives even as christ also loved the church and then he gave himself for it that he might cleanse it by the washing of water and then he says so that he will present unto himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but it should be without blame just holy and righteous in james chapter 5 james chapter 5 verses 7 and 8 be patient therefore brethren unto the coming of the lord behold the husband man waited for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain be ye also patient establish your hearts for the coming of the lord draweth near the program of the lord for the church demands that the that the lord will come again did he not promise us we're going to reign with him he, him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me on the throne so that he'll be able to rule with me. That has not been done yet. That demands that Christ must come again. Not only the program of the church, the program of the Lord for Israel demands that he must come again. God has not finished his timetable, his program, his plan for the children of Israel. He came the first time and he rejected him. And all the things that God said will happen between their savior and that nation, between the Messiah and that nation. All those things, they have not been fulfilled. And because they have not been fulfilled, the Lord still must have to come again so that he'll be able to do all that he wanted to do. Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59, reading verses 20 and 21. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from, the, from transgression. In Jacob says the Lord, as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, says the Lord from henceforth and forever. That has not happened yet because they rejected the word of the Lord. When Christ came the first time, for that to be fulfilled, Jesus has to come again. Not only that, the Lord has a provision and he has a kind of a program for the nations, for the gentle nations. And his program for the gentle nations demand that Christ must return. He must return so that he'll be able to fulfill all that the Father had outlined that will happen. When Jesus comes again, you find this in Joel. Joel we're looking at chapter 3. Joel chapter 3. Look at verse 2 to start with. Joel 3, 2. And I will also gather all nations. I will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. I will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel. Whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And then he tells us reading from verse 9. He says proclaim this. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all men of war draw near and let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come. All ye heathen and gather yourselves together round about. I see the cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Then it says, let the heathen be weakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I seek to judge all the heathen round about. That has not happened yet. That must happen. Because of that, we know that Christ must come again. Not only that, the humiliation of Jesus Christ demands that he must return in glory. Do you think that the Father will allow that the world, the last thing they will see of Jesus Christ is carrying the cross and sweating and falling under that cross and then spitting upon him, nailing him to the cross and saying, if you are the Savior, come down, they will believe on you. It, because it was a time of sorrow, a time of shame, a time of humiliation and degradation. As he was almost naked there on the cross, and then he was bleeding, the hands bleeding, the legs bleeding, and blood coming out everywhere, and probably flies all flying around. You think that is the last you'll see of the glorified Christ and the risen Christ? No. 
If they have seen his humiliation, they must see his glorification and exaltation. That's why the humiliation of Jesus Christ demands he must come again. In fact, he told them he was coming again, that he will come in glory when he was being betrayed and they were questioning him. He said, this is not the last of me you are going to see. You see me now humble and dying as a sacrifice. You'll see me again and it will be as a sovereign reigning upon the throne of the Almighty. Mighty God. In Matthew chapter 26, Matthew chapter 26, I'm reading to you from verse 63. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is this? What is it which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus says unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And you see what the Lord is telling us, He's saying, You have not seen anything. You see me not just dying for sinners. I'm going to come and I'm going to reign upon the whole world. Not only that, the expectation of the saints demand. That Jesus must come again. That's our expectation. That's our hope. We have been redeemed. And then we're looking for a redeemer. We have not seen him yet. We have believed. And then our hearts are panting. Our hearts are desiring. The expectation of the saints is that one day the king will come. And when the king comes, we will see him face to face. Today we have glory. Well, today we have the grace of God. And tomorrow when he comes, we'll have the glory with him. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now it comes in verse 13, Titus chapter 2. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ is coming again. And we have all this in the scriptures telling us because God has promised and because the word of Jesus Christ himself has made a declaration and a proclamation and because the Holy Ghost has given us a guarantee and because the program of the church will terminate with the glorious appearing of the Lord and because the program of God for the nations and for Israel and the humiliation of Christ which must not end there which must end up in glorification and exaltation and because of the heart, the desire, the panting and the expectation of the saints of God we know that Jesus Christ will come again. But there are direct references to the coming of the Lord. In Daniel chapter Daniel chapter 7, you've seen how John the Beloved, how he just became so excited and he said, behold, I see something and I'm telling you, why don't you get excited in your spirit also as John, when he says, behold, he cometh with the clouds. And you'll see that the same announcement had been made prophetically by Daniel in Daniel chapter Chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 13. And I, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds. You remember what we we're reading in Revelation? Behold, he cometh with the clouds. And then he says, One like the Son of Man, here is Jesus Christ, came with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient of days. That's God the Father. And they brought him. Christ near unto him the Father, and there was given him dominion and glory, and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. And that's what gives us the confidence the Lord is coming again. And thank God we know it. And thank God we are preparing ourselves. Those who are saved, those who are born again, those who are living the life that glorifies the Lord. When the Lord comes, it will be the joy of your heart. In Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. I'm reading to you from verse 30. Matthew 24, verse 30, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with 
power and great glory. You compare that with Revelation chapter 1 verse 3. And you will see that those two passages are saying exactly the same thing. Behold, he cometh with the clouds. And every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, everybody, amen. The Lord is coming again. In Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Reading from verse 31. The assurance. The certainty. That the Lord who has gone away into glory. That from glory he will be coming again. He's coming with the clouds. In Matthew chapter 25. Reading from verse 31. It says when the son of man shall come in his glory. Do you see that every time? He says he comes. And when he comes not in humiliation. When he comes, not in shame, not in sorrow, not in suffering. When he comes, when he comes again, it will not be like the first time when he came and he was killed. He was crucified for us, for you and for me. But when he comes again, it will be in his glory. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats it tells us that we shall be ready then and we shall be prepared it tells us in mark chapter 8 mark chapter 8 Knowing that the Lord will come, it should demand something from you. Knowing that the Lord is coming in glory. And knowing that when he, come, when he comes, he comes as King of kings and Lord of lords. That should demand something from you. Mark chapter 8, verse 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words... In this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father. You cannot miss it. You cannot miss it. What the Lord is saying, because he repeats it every time, that when he comes, it will be in glory. And those clouds that are referred to, the clouds are the glory of the Lord. Because when the sun shall be darkened, and then the clouds of glory, like a million suns shining in the brightness, that will be great glory. And when all those angels, and when those angels appear, they'll appear in white. And 10,000 times 10,000 myriads of saints, the redeemed of the Lord, clothed in white raiment, which is the righteousness of the saints. And then the, the, the sky will just be open. Christ himself, the glory of a million sons, and the glory of the brightness and the blazing light of those angels and redeemed souls, that will be glory indeed. That's why he says, when he cometh in the glory of his father with the holy angels, it should be the heart of your own desire, your heart's desire, that when he comes, you will be there. I pray nothing will hinder you. In Mark chapter 13, Mark chapter 13, reading from verse 26. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. It's always with glory, all these references. And then it says, and then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds and from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Then we're told in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, reading from verse 4. Colossians 3, verse 4. Emphasis and guarantee that the Lord is coming again and you ought to be prepared. Every one of us will to be prepared. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in what? In glory. So when the Lord comes, he will come in the glory or the glory of his father. As we look at these references, we know that when Jesus came for the first time into this world, we saw his humiliation. But when he comes the second time, we'll see his exaltation and glory. He will come in the clouds of glory. That he is heavenly glory. Indescribable glory. The glory of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ has no parallel in history. 
Do you remember when those three disciples of his, James, John, and Peter, when they saw the transfiguration of Jesus Christ on the holy mount, when his face became radiant like the sun, and his raiment became shining exceedingly white as snow, they beheld his glory and majesty at that time. And yet, the glory that is to come, the glory at his second coming, is incomparably greater, infinitely more magnificent and majestic. Imagine Christ coming or the blazing light of a million suns after our own sun, the, the sun that you see now, after that one has been darkened and the moon has been turned to blood. And then Jesus comes in the blazing light of a million suns with 10,000 and 10,000 and thousands and thousands of holy angels in blazing glory together with all the glorified saints of the Old Testament and the New Testament who are dressed in blazing white robes, riding in blazing white horses. Then you have the picture of Christ coming again, coming in the clouds of glory. Majestic scene, wonderful scene. This is a mystery. The Lord is revealing to us. And those who have seen the humiliation of Christ will one day see the glory of the Lord. We come to point number two gladness and gloominess at Christ's second coming. We come back to Revelation chapter one. Revelation chapter one, we're reading from verse seven. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. As John the Beloved declared the coming of the Lord, that he will come again. You know, when he came the first time, not everybody knew. In fact, in Bethlehem where he was born, not everybody knew. And when the wise men came from the east, they came to Jerusalem. They say, we're looking for the king of the Jews that has just been born. And then Herod had to check up. And then the people, the priests, they looked at the Bible, the Old Testament. And they said, yes, it will be in Bethlehem. And Herod said, go and find out. Because not everybody was sure. They didn't know that he had been born. Yes, angels announced the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, but he just went to the shepherds who were watching over their, uh, over their sheep in the field. But apart from that, just a few people knew. But when he comes again, every eye shall see him. His coming will be visible to the entire human race. This time, the world will recognize him. And for the first time when he came, his glory was veiled. It was called away from them. But at the second coming of Christ, the glory, the splendor, the majesty will be visible for everyone to see. Do you see there are two groups there that will see the Lord? Look at it in verse 7. Every eye shall see him. And then he divides those people to two groups. Number one, they also which pierced him. That is the Jews. The people that crucified the Lord, they will see the Lord Jesus Christ. The Jews will see the Lord when he comes. And then he says, second part, all the kindreds of the earth. All the kindreds of the earth. That's the second group. And then he tells us that the two groups, they will mourn. They will cry. It says, they will wail because of him. And let's look at it one by one. First of all, the first group, the people that pierced him. Those Jewish people in John, in John chapter 19. John chapter 19, reading from verse 37. John 19, verse 37. It says, and again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. This is referring to the coming of the Lord. It says, after they crucified him. After they had pierced him. Then it says the scripture has been fulfilled. These Jewish people, they rejected the Messiah. They rejected Christ. But then there's a preparation for them. Because there's a scripture that says, They shall look on him whom they pierced. Where is that scripture? That's in Zechariah chapter 12. Turn into your Bible. Zechariah chapter 12. That's where the prophecy was given that the Jewish people, a time is coming when they will mourn and they will look on the Lord Jesus Christ whom they crucified. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the spirit of grace, the spirit of supplication and they shall look upon him whom they have 
appears and they shall mourn for him and as one mourneth for his only son and they shall be in bitterness for him and as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn the prophecy is telling us that it will be the time of grace for the children of Israel because you see when Jesus Christ first came they rejected him crucify him let his blood be upon us and upon our children and right now since that time until this time about 2,000 years that nation of Israel had not believed the Lord but then it says the time is coming when Christ comes again and the Lord Almighty according to his prophecy and promise here he'll pour upon them the house of David the people of David that is the people of Israel and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and the spirit of supplication and then they begin to mourn for what terrible crimes they had committed for crucifying the Lord Jesus Christ for piercing the feet and the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ it will be a cry of repentance it will be a mourning groaning of repentance as they call upon the Lord and as the Lord pours grace upon them and then in verse 11 it says and in that day in that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadarimon in the valley of Megiddon and it says and in the land shall and the land shall mourn every family apart the family of the house of David apart and their wives apart and the family of the house of Nathan apart and their wives apart and the family of the house of Levi apart and their wives apart and the family of Shimei apart and their wives apart and all the families that remain every family apart and their wives apart that is they'll mourn because of what they had done to the Lord and then the Lord will receive them in Revelation, sorry, in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1, in that day shall there be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. That is the fountain of the blood of Jesus that they rejected at that time. At this time now, they will receive, they will accept, and that fountain of the blood of the Lamb will cleanse them from all their sins. The conversion we experience now, they will experience at that time. The cleansing that that we experience now they will experience at that time in verse 6 of that same chapter it says and one shall say unto him what are these ones in thine hands that is when Christ comes again as Zechariah even though the thing had not happened he knew it will happen the first coming they will pierce him and then the second coming when he comes the second time they'll be asking him now they'll be friendly They'll be sympathetic. Now they want to have fellowship with him. And they will be saying, how is it that your hands are like this? And your feet like this? And one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. I came, I wanted to be friendly. I came, I wanted to get you to myself in fellowship. But what you did was to pierce me, to pierce my hands and to pierce my feet. And then in verse 9, it says, And I will bring the third part with the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried and they shall call on my name and I will hear them and I will say it is my people and they shall say the Lord is my God. The Lord will give them conversion and when the Lord gives them that conversion they'll be mourning, they'll be crying. How is it we waited so long before we received our Messiah? How is it we were so wicked and cruel and so ignorant and were so blinded blindfolded by religion that we didn't allow him to reign over us at the first time. But they came, they will come to the Lord and then there will be joy. There will be mourning for joy. There will be groaning for joy. There will be tears of joy. Now as they come back, as they know the Lord. Isaiah chapter 25. Isaiah chapter 25 verse 9. And it shall be said in that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. That is the children of Israel. And they are waiting for their Messiah right now. They do not have the revelation yet that Jesus Christ has come. And they have been waiting. And as they are waiting and waiting, then Christ will come in the glory of his Father. Then they will see him. And the Spirit of God will make them to recognize that this is Jesus. This is the Messiah. And they will say, we have waited for him. And he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. We are told in Romans 
chapter 11. Still talking about these children of Israel. How? When the Lord comes, he will redeem them. In Romans chapter 11, reading from verse 25. Romans 11 verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is upon unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be coming. That is, the Gentiles are getting saved now. The Gentiles are receiving the Lord now, but the Gentiles should not be ignorant of this, that there is a mystery now, that Jesus Christ will come. And when he comes, the blindness in their mind will be taken away because that will be the time of the fulfillment of the promise of God for them when the fullness of the Gentiles begin to happen. It says in verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, They shall come out of Zion, the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sin. But as you come to Revelation chapter 1, and you look at verse 7. You know there are two groups there. As I've told you. Behold they come with the clouds. And every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him. That's the one group we've been talking about. They get saved. They mourn. They cry. They groan. And they shed tears. And they are very sympathetic now. How is it to appear? And then they come to know the Lord. But then in the second group. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. The kindreds of the earth. Now these ones. These are the Gentiles. And this one is different. This one they will be crying because of the terror. Because of the things their eyes will see. And because of what will come upon them. Please understand. At that time the church will have been raptured. And the church will have gone to be with the Lord. And when the Lord comes at this time. He will be coming with thousands and thousands of the saints. And then he will be coming to judge the Gentile nations. That's when he will part the nations in two. The sheep on this side. And the goats on the other side. And when the Gentiles who have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. When they see him. They will be afraid. Because of what will come upon them. In Matthew chapter 24. Reading there in verse 30. And then. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The details are given to us in Revelation chapter 6. You see what we're reading in Revelation chapter 1? That's the conclusion. That's the climax. It's like looking ahead of time, saying, This is the conclusion. You will still read from chapter 6 of Revelation till chapter 19, the great tribulation. And then in chapter 19, the saints of God. Then in chapter 20, you'll find that Jesus Christ will establish his millennial reign. But John is just giving us now the summary. He's saying, behold, I see something here. I see the conclusion. I see the summary of the book of Revelation. When eventually he will come. And then he tells us that these gentle people, they will wail, they will mourn. Because the time of judgment had come for them. Revelation chapter 6 verse 15. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man. And it says, they hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains, to the rocks, fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? You see, that's the reason they will mourn. That's the reason they will cry. I pray you will not be among them. You'll be part of the glorious church that had been taken away at the time of the rapture. You have seen for the children of Israel, they'll be mourning and wailing in repentance. Multitudes of them will be saved. But the Gentiles, they'll be mourning in terror because of the fear of judgment. The second coming of Christ will spell the doom and inescapable judgment for the impenitent, for the hardened sinners. The sudden realization of the coming of the wrath of the Lamb as he appears in glory will make them to mourn and to wail in fear and in anguish. Gladness for the redeemed, gloominess for the rebellious. We come to point number three. This is God's guarantee 
of Christ's second coming. Please come back to Revelation chapter 1. We're looking at verse 8, but I'm going to back up to verse 7 so you can see the connection. It says, Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. It says, Even so, everybody, amen. You know what John is saying here? He said, Behold, I see something here. And he said, everything will come to attention. Everything will just stop. Everything just becomes chill. All activities on earth, all activities in heaven, all activities everywhere, they stop as the majestic, glorious king, as he moves on, as comes to this world. And then he says, even so, amen. You know what John is saying here? When he said, even so, amen, he uses Greek and he uses Hebrew. He, he uses Hebrew and he says, yes. That's the amen there. And then he uses the other language. He says, yes. That's even so. That means, yes. Amen. That means, yes. It's like he combines the two languages together. The language of the Old Testament, Hebrew. And the language of the New Testament, Greek. And he says, yes, yes. He is coming. Old Testament says, yes. New Testament says, yes. He's coming. Amen means, so let it be. Even so, so let it be. It's, he is coming. Yes, it is. So let it be. He's so excited. He combines those three languages together just to tell you that it is certain. Let the Hebrews understand it's coming. Let the Greeks understand it's coming. Let the Jewish people, the Israelites, let them know. The people that choose the Hebrew language, yes, he is coming. And the Gentiles that choose the Greek language, let them understand he is coming. Yes, yes, it's coming again. And then in verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega. That is the guarantee. Tarantino. After we have been told about the coming of the Lord, Almighty God now says, yes, I give the guarantee. I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. The Almighty. You will see here is the Lord introducing himself. Is the Lord saying what you just heard? The declaration of the revelation that you had now from John, that Jesus Christ, my only begotten son, that is coming again, I give the guarantee, I give the stamp of authority and approval, and I'm the one, the almighty, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the ending, the one that was an is and will come, I'm the one that is giving the guarantee that my only begotten son, he came forth, he's coming again. In Isaiah chapter 41, you see the attributes of the Lord, the attributes the declaration of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 41 verse 4 who has wrought and done it calling the generations from the beginning I the Lord the first and the last I am he it says I'm the one that is giving the guarantee that Christ will come again and then in Revelation chapter 21 Revelation chapter 21 reading there in verse 6 Revelation chapter 21, verse 6. And he said unto me, It is none. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountains of the water of life freely. It's just giving us assurance that this one that cannot lie, this one that is infinite, omnipotent, that he is the one that is going to fulfill all that he has said. Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. And the four beasts, those are the living creatures, the zoes in Greek, uh, the living creatures, at each of them six wings about him and that they were full of eyes within and they rest not day and night saying holy 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 lord god almighty which was and is and is to come so you will see that when it says i'm the one that was and is and i'm still to come it means i'm the eternally existent one i was there in the past i'm there in the present i will be there in the future and because i'm always there i was there in the past when the prophecy was given I am there in the present and I'm watching over my program and my plan. And I will be there in the future to make sure that what I have declared and prophesied, what I have predicted comes to pass. In the past I was there. In the present I'm there. And then in the future I will be there. The one that was and is and ought and will be forever. And it says the Lord God Almighty. In chapter 11 verse 17. Revelation chapter 11 verse 17. 
there he tells us saying we give thee glory O Lord God Almighty which art and was and art to come you see they, they're giving us something about God they say he is present everywhere he was there in the past he was he is there in the present he is and he will be there in the future he is the one that is to come because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. What the Lord is telling us is that whatever he has declared that he will do, he will definitely do it and there is no one that can hinder him. Satan cannot hinder God. Am I right? The demons cannot hinder God. Is that right? And there is no theologian, there is no opposer that can hinder the Lord. Whatever God has said he will do, he will do. I said they will do. In Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. Reading from verse 12. Jeremiah 1 verse 12. Then said the Lord unto me. Thou hast well seen. For I will hasten my word to perform it. I will hasten my word to perform it. Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. And I'm reading in verse 13. Yea. Behold, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will walk, and who shall hinder it? Who shall let it? Nobody. I said nobody. John was so excited about the announcement of Christ's second coming. And he responded, even so, amen. And I told you already, he employed two languages, Hebrew and Greek, to make the affirmation. Yes, yes. Even so, amen. Do it, Lord. Let it be. At every, at, at the very end of the revelation, John had not lost that same expectation, exuberance, and excitement concerning the coming of the Lord, the return of the Lord. Because as the Lord says, surely I come quickly, immediately at the end of revelation, he, re he responded again, amen, even so, come Lord Jesus. As he was excited and thrilled, so should we be thrilled at the announcement of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see this revelation chapter 1 verse 8, which we have read, it gives us the affirmation of the announcement that God Almighty assures us of the certainty of Christ's return. And he gives three of his attributes to confirm that nothing can hinder or derail the plan or the program of the second coming of Christ. Number one is omniscience. When he said, I am Alpha and Omega. You know what those are? That's the first letter and the last letter of the alphabet. And any word you want to have, any knowledge you want to proclaim, anything you want to write, down you use the alphabet use the letters of the alphabet and as he said i'm alpha and omega the first and the last letters of the greek alphabet is saying that in a marvelous way as the alphabet contained the store of all knowledge so god almighty has all knowledge and the god of all knowledge affirms and confirms that jesus christ is coming again and i'm telling you from the knowledge of the lord himself and the knowledge of the word of god that jesus will come again but then he tells us it's not only his omniscience he talks about his omnipresence he which is and which was and which is to come that means eternally, past, present, and future, always there. And is eternally present. And this eternally present one, that is always there. He confirms that nothing will be able to derail his program until he fulfills everything. He's watching over his program until he fulfills it. And nothing can follow the plan of Christ's return. Because God, who is always there, will see to it that Christ returns at the appointed time. Then somebody might say, yes, he may know everything. Yes, he may be everywhere, every time. Maybe there is somebody that is more powerful than himself. That will be able to turn around and reverse the program of the Lord. That's why the Lord now talks about his omnipotence. He says, I am the Lord God Almighty, all powerful. That means there is no other power besides his power. The all powerful God who is able to crush all opposing forces and powers confirms that Christ will come again because there is no power that can hinder or resist that. The almighty God affirms that Christ is coming again. The angels affirm that Christ is coming again. Redeemed souls affirm that Christ is coming again. All living, believing, expectant saints respond even so, amen, even so come, Lord Jesus, the Lord is coming. 
When he comes, where will you be? John is calling you to attention. He says, stop every other thing now. He says, look away from everything now and just look unto Jesus and look up because the glorification, exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ is about to take place. Behold, he cometh with the clouds. Every eye shall see him, you will see him. They also which pierced him and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. And I believe that you are joining in with John and you are saying, yes, that's my desire. I'm waiting for him is a is a passion of my heart is a desire of my soul i want jesus christ to come and take me out of this earth and i want to reign with him i am eager i want you to happen now even so lord amen and then the lord says just keep on and remain with the lord and he says i will hold your hand till the very end i will make sure that when he comes you will still be there when he comes you'll be among the people that will be glorified with the lord he is alpha and omega it's the beginning and the end says the Lord which is and which was and which is to come the almighty is able to keep you to the end and the Lord will keep you when the Lord comes you will not be missing the Lord is coming why don't you tell the Lord I know you are mighty I know you are powerful and I know you will keep me you will not allow me to perish or the people of the world when the Lord comes I will be there my brother you will be there my sister you will be there give yourself to the Lord say yes Lord yes Lord yes Lord I know you are coming even so Lord Jesus come